that courthouse been sitting there now since 1910. Papa helped build that. Papa was one of the carpenters on it. I say 1910. I, it could have been 1912. I ain't sure. Marvin, honey, quit a staring down the barrel of that shotgun. You go blow your head off and your mama wear you out, young man. Uh, and, and I quoted the black minister who, who the Sunday before had said, Go down, angel, consume the flood. Snuff out the sun and turn the moon to blood. Go down, angel, and close the door. Times have been shan't be no more. And Dobie said, where is that man? And I said, he's out there at that little church, Friendly Will Baptist Church in South Austin. He said, will you take me to hear him? And from that, that was in 1935, from then on, Dobie took a very active interest and encouraged me, and that's how I came to write my thesis, Ten Negro Sermon. And I'd been known as Tricky Dicky for 20 years, and yet you gave me a overwhelming mandate. Now you pick me up off a running a red light called Watergate, for God's sakes. Texas beloved folk humorist John Henry Falk spend some yarns, provide some political commentary, wrapped in his usual insightful warm wit. Tonight on Alternative Views. Those of us in Austin and um, most all of us in Texas know John Henry Falk, love him dearly, and we know him as a folk humorist and uh, as a civil libertarian who fought against Joe McCarthy in the blacklisting the, back in the 50s. And we know him as a media figure on radio, television, author of books. And we know him also as a great communicator. He's even able to, to uh, convert some rednecks sometimes to the progressive way of thinking, and that's uh, no easy task. He's written two books, Fear on Trial, about his experiences during the McCarthy era, and now is a new one, Uncensored John Henry Falk. And if you want to spend uh, an evening just laughing your guts out and thinking at the same time, well, this is the book for you, because it has so many of the great things that we know that uh, John Henry Falk, we've heard him and seen him do, well, it's in print now, and you can... And you, there's one thing in there I learned about John Henry. I didn't know that he was a scholar. John Henry, you were a scholar back at oh, the University yes. of Texas. Uh, yes, uh, profound scholar, a man of infinite wisdom and truth. <laughs> <laughs> Scholarship always escaped me <laughs> by a wide margin. You did, but you that's did. very kind of you to say, I want to con correct something if I might, and that's Please. a terrible way to start a program off of correcting that's okay. something. You said, I've, convert, I've even converted rednecks. <laughs> you see, in my in my way of thinking, there are no rednecks per se in, in the ordinary sense of what we think of rednecks. There are rednecks I know that are Phi Beta Kappas and PhDs at the University of Texas. I know some rednecks uh, on the, uh, in, belongs to the president's cabinet. <laughs> in fact, I, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, the president's a redneck at times. If by redneck you're referring to people who are uninformed on the issues and or have a very backward and punitive attitude toward those more positive aspects of our society. I didn't mean to correct you, but I just, it ain't converting rednecks that I've, I've ever engaged in. I, what I've tried to do always is, is uh, communicate some of the joys of being alive to people and if 
by that process, I somehow <laughs> get some folks thinking that way, then it's more the more the good fortune of mine. Can you hold that uh, your book up there so I we sure can get a good shot of it? I'll there? be glad to. Let me hold it. Like you know, this. it's <laughs> it, it's a vicious book in a way because not only do you read it and you can't put it down like they say, but then you reread it. And you reread it, <laughs> and you spend so much that's, time with isn't it. Isn't that a sweet thing? But so. Uh, so many great things in there about humor and folk humor, and I'd like to talk with you about this, uh, Craig Hattersley and I. In your book, they talk about the difference of uh, that a folk humorist is compared to other types, a comedian or a comic. Yes. Or what 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 is the difference? Well, I think the reason they they refer to me as a folk humorist is that very early in life I out in South Austin, Texas, here in Travis County, I uh, evolved a, a way of looking at the world that came kind of natural to me, came from my parents, really, and from my neighbors, who mostly were folk folk. They were, uh, my mother, for instance, when I was a little boy, used to say, you know, I wouldn't take a million dollars for Johnny but I wouldn't give you a dime for a dozen more just like him. <laughs> well, uh, this this gentle put down, you know, I would, oh, I'd love to buy Johnny for what he's worth and sell him for what he thinks he's worth. <laughs> uh, this this way of looking at life and, and gently, you know, nudging you back into your, when you got too big for your britches, uh, came naturally to me. And uh, I learned very early in life to have to laugh at myself. It was, it was a kind of a defensive mechanism. I was raised out in South Austin in a very ordinary Texas household. My father was a lawyer, but he fancied himself a farmer too, so we were raised on a farm. We had cows to milk. We had a family, a black family, that lived on our place and looked after the heavy work for us, and Daddy did his lawyering over in Austin. So he was quite a performer himself. Did this yes. influence you and your Yes, he had a very keen sense of satire, and he was born and raised a sharecropper, and he had the earth. He had that wonderful sense of the Texas earth and the humor. You see that derived, actually, from the origins of our society. This is what very few people realize. This is why Mark Twain was such a master of it in the 19th century, saw it come to such full bloom with Josh Billings and Bill Nye and others. This, this use of folk imagery and folk situations to puncture pomposity and humbug we were born into a society, the first self-governing society on the face of the earth in modern times, you know. Very few people realize this. Very few people realize that the people are sovereign and the government is servant in our society. But that is basically what those gentlemen 200 years ago set up. The people would be the masters and the government would be the servant. This is a powerful, this is something very powerful. And those birds in Washington forget this, see, and the ones in Austin forget it. And so it, one of the ways we managed a hundred years ago, and fortunately still kind of hang on, there's still a residue of it, I'd like to think that I'm a practitioner of this, is you keep them in line by uh, saying, hey, you are hired hands. Ronnie, you work for me. I don't work for you. You asked for this job. You and that bird you got up there as your vice president, or Bush, <laughs> you all came in and said, you know how to drive this old American bus, that you all had the, the blueprint to how road to prosperity and peace and happiness. Uh, you get off, you drive the bus off in the short, uh, short rows and start bouncing daylight out of me and my wife and children and scaring the daylights out of the old folks. <laughs> And we tap you on show and say, Ronnie, get back up on the highway where you said you're going to drive. Take us that peace and prosperity. All this warmongering you're doing around the world and willing to kick the daylights out of anybody who don't agree with you is entirely liking. You start driving the way we want you to drive. Well, you use the cutting edge snodgrass quite frequently yes. as a vehicle yes. or as a medium for expressing your political mm -hmm. humor. I evolved cousin Ed snodgrass to pretty much embody the uh, a point of view that's very prevalent in this country, a point of view that, after all, elected Ronald Reagan president and supports him. A uh, point of view, Cousin Ed, for instance, the other day said, Johnny, there's three great truths in this world. Number one, and I'll fight for any one of them, Johnny. 
The first one is that Ronald Reagan's the greatest president the United States has ever had. And the second one is Jesse Helms, the greatest statesman this country's ever known. And the third one is the Earth's a flat surface. Well, this this is the way I comment on those two gentlemen and on the... Hey, I let Cousin Ed Snodgrass do it. Cousin Ed's uh, uh, 86 years old. He's been mad for 80 of them. He was six years old when his mom and daddy told him the South had lost the Civil War. And he's been uh, pouting about it ever since. Got a big sign over his fireplace. Yankee beware. Robert E. Lee might have surrendered, but I ain't. <laughs> and uh, he embodies most of the philosophy and thoughts and outrage that people we <laughs> hear with uh, you had uh, from that particular political point of view. You used as uh, cutting that snodgrass real well uh, to roast uh, Richard Nixon over and the uh, oh, and the yes. Watergate situation. In your book, yes. you have one about. Uh, Cousin Ed saying that Nixon ought to get a cease and desist order, you remember? Yes. You know, that that became a very effective piece that I used before bankers groups and, you know, uh, conservative groups that I spoke before. I'd say, now I'm not going to, this is after Dick got run out of office, you know. You know, this was history making for a president to behave, a practicing criminal to be driven out of office, the highest office in the land, and his vice president, old Spyro Agnew was driven out too, you know, for being a crook, being an outright crook, and Richard Nixon for being a, being not only a liar but a, but a double dyed liar, you know, and, and a man that committed felony, a felony, you know, swore to false facts to, to betray the American people, it was such an outrageous thing that uh, after he kicked out, you know, his stock had sunk pretty low, and all these people that were rejoicing in him in 1974, uh, or in 1972 when he'd run for re-election, were cooled off considerable. So I, I evolved this piece, because cousin, cousin Ed Snodgrass comes roaring over to my house and says, uh, Johnny, you know, if I was Richard Nixon, this is after he took off for San Simeon, see, so but left office. Gerald Ford become her. If I was Dick Nixon, I'd get me, uh, I'd go down down to the Capitol and hire the best lawyer I could get a hold of, a Jim cracking lawyer, and I'd fly at them rascals. I'd swear and aver and get a cease and desist order and a habeas corpus and all such as that. And I would aver as follows. <laughs> My name is Richard Nixon, better known as Tricky Dicky. <laughs> when I run in 1972, I run not as a stranger, but as one of the best known men in the new United States of America, and I'd been known as Tricky Dicky for 20 years. And yet you gave me a overwhelming mandate. And he did get on with women. When I run in 1968, I said I would end the war in Vietnam, had a secret plan for it. And uh, four years later, I'd spread it all over the map of Southeast Asia. Killed more people and done more bombing than had been did before. And yet in 1972, after all of that, you gave me a mandate. Uh, I go down the list about ten. Minutes. Now you pick me up off for running a red light called Watergate, for God's sakes. Look at my face. You say I'm a crook? You say I can't, you can't believe me? Well, listen, America, you'd better look in the mirror and see your own face. I've just been doing it the way you wanted it done, that's all. I'm a reflection of you. Ooh, you could send an audience tearing its hair, you know, because every one of them had voted for him and old Spiro Agnew, and everything he was saying was absolutely true there. After that, you wrote a piece, and this was with uh, some kind of prescience, I think, because it was in 73, 74, you wrote a piece about Ronald Reagan, why he was the perfect president. Yeah. Yeah. It was prophetic, wasn't it? It really was. <laughs> I thought it was... Yeah. Yeah, Cousin Ed Snodgrass comes roaring over to my house that morning and 
Dick had been kicked out of office, you know, or, or was fixing to be. He hadn't hadn't been kicked out, I believe, when I wrote that piece. Cousin Ed says, don't worry, we've got the perfect candidate. Oh, we got the man to replace Dick, and we'll still be in the we'll still be in the White House. We got it made now. And I say, Cousin Ed, do you mean John Connolly, who had just been converted as a Republican, hadn't been indicted at that time? <laughs> yeah. And he said, no, sir. Don't mean John Connolly. He done got in trouble. No, sir. I mean the man that nobody can put a hand on. He's a trained actor. He ain't got much. Uh, his name is Ronnie Reagan from California. And I said, oh, Ronald Reagan, governor of California? He hasn't got a chance in the world. Great goodness alive. He's nothing but a movie actor. He said, that's our whole point. He's a movie actor. He don't say nothing. He never has said nothing that nobody could remember so much as five minutes. But he's just the perfect person to replace Dick Nixon. That's Cousin Ed Snodgrass. I think you also made a point in that story that all the other presidents they've had have been actors, but... They just uh, were amateurs. Yes, now we've got to get a professional. professional. That's right. That's right. <laughs> like, you all have done your homework <laughs> in this book. Oh, it's wonderful. Sure. It's wonderful. You cost, it nice. cost me a lot of sleep last night. Oh, after I read them, I had to read them again and, uh, to a friend of mine and then uh, keep it going. Well, that's very pleasant to hear because, you know, uh, when I got this mm -hmm. thing together, it consists of a lot of the pieces that I've written in the past and a lot of them that I did have done verbally but have never a lot of the satires that I did uh, on uh, that Pear Orchard USA where I take the about it's nine characters, that. nine different characters, but I never had written them out. And apparently it worked because I got a letter today from Tris Coffin up in Washington, D.C., and he said he and his wife had been reading them out loud to one another, which I found terribly flattering. And it's real nice. Well, they bring the characters to life, the dialects that you, you get into. You, the dialects are perfect. You, you can just imagine somebody saying them by reading them. Isn't that nice over here? Well, you, you, did, you did a lot of research on this in your uh, master's thesis at the University of Texas, no, which no. under under Adobe was about, uh, what, ten black uh, ten, sermons? Ten Negro it? sermons. Yeah. This, this was, just think, this was 45 years ago that I did that. Yeah. No, more than that, 40, almost a half century ago, I'd been studying with Doby. I'd come to admire him a great deal. Uh, in fact, he was an inspiration to me. He's a great man. J. Frank Doby, for those of you that don't know, was a professor at the University of Texas, but he was also a writer and a folklorist and one of the first persons who turned my eyes, he and Alan Lomax, who was a boy raised in Austin, whose father was a great folklorist, collected cowboy songs. They turned my eyes back toward Texas and our own culture and what we had created here, what the people of Texas, black and brown and white, had created here. Not the, not the names that are known and recorded, but the names that have never been heard, but the poetry and music and the, and the uh, lovely, lovely folk stories and songs that they'd created, I got very excited over it and I realized we were a cultured people. We didn't have to go to the Ivy League colleges to get our culture. That We had a culture, it was a different kind of culture, but a rich, a rich and soul fulfilling one and that turned me in turn toward the black community that Austin at that time, we had a black family living on our place and there were a great number of blacks in Austin then, but it was a segregated, it segregated by law then. And uh, they, it was uh, understood that blacks were to keep their places. But as a little boy, I had gone to their churches with my black friends and heard their singing and knew there was something unusual about it. Well, when I got up into Dobie's class, and Dobie had been collecting folklore from, uh, from his uh, uh, Mexican vaqueros, uh, the cowboys, the Mexican cowboys down in South Texas, their songs and their stories, and emphasize the importance of this as a look at the real texture of your society. This is where it is in those folk stories and in those folk songs. I got to tell them about these some of the black friends that I had, and particularly the black ministers. You see, most of them were uh, worked uh, farmers. They, they lived on farms, and many of them were almost completely illiterate or just barely literate, 
but all of them had this gift of great folk imagery and, and to evoke almost a Miltonic image as they preached because the only great literature they had ever encountered was the Holy Bible. And they took it and wove their own story and their own hardships into it. And they knew all the characters of the Bible. They were personal friends with little David and old man Goliath and old Daniel wandering around there in the wild lion's den. And, and I knew there was something magnificent about it. And so I went to Dobie and told him about this black friend. Dobie was a man of prejudice, by the way. He was very prejudiced about mm -hmm. blacks and about Mexicans. They, they were where they were because that's where they belonged in the order of things in this country. He didn't challenge the segregation or, or didn't challenge the, any of the racist injustices that existed and were taken for granted then. But at any rate, I got telling about this black minister. And he said, uh, and, and I quoted a black minister who, who the Sunday before had said, Go down, angel, consume the flood. Snuff out the sun and turn the moon to blood. Go down, angel, and close the door. Times have been shan't be no more. And Dobie said, Where is that man? And I said, He's out there at that little church, Friendly Will Baptist Church in South Austin. He said, Will you take me to hear him? And from that, that was in 1935, from then on, Dobie took a very active interest and encouraged me, and that's how I came to write my thesis, Ten Negro Sermons. The word Negro was the way you designate, if you were progressive and enlightened, the way you designated our black citizens then. Otherwise, you called them colored or darkies, uh, two very patronizing words, you see. But... Uh, I wrote these sermons, I took these sermons down uh, verbatim and uh, include two of them in, our, yeah, two of them in my yeah. book. But you notice that they're written in, in, in phonetically and in dialect. And I was very concerned over that when my editor down at the Texas Monthly who published this book, uh, at Texas Monthly Press, said, look, uh, we want to do them just the way you wrote them. And I said, well, that's, that was 50 years ago, and that's the way you wrote black speech then. But it sounds too much like uh, Amos and Andy to suit me. I, I'm uncomfortable with letting these things go out that way. And he said, no, we, the integrity of it is the important thing. And that's the way they were written, and that's the way you should do them if you, that's the way this should be published in your book. And... That's the reason they're written that way. It's the only way I could devise 50 years ago of catching the cadence and the rich folk imagery and the nuances and uh, the zest that I felt as I sat there and listened to these magnificent men and with the absolute Miltonic splendor, preaching in some little church that was leaning sideways down the bottom. And no one at this time, you understand, was collecting this material. Folk, folklore collecting was not, uh, was confined to a, it was a very academic exercise and confined to an esoteric few at the, in the, in a, in the academic community. Well, in your book you also have a lot of stories that are not political in nature but just funnier in hell. <clears throat> and, for instance, like the Ben Rutledge story. Yes. Okay, could yes. you tell us that one? Well, Ben Rutledge, I, I have this imaginary town of, that I created called Pear Orchard, Texas, and it's, it, it's right there between, uh, everybody knows where it is here in Texas, it's right between El Paso and Texarkana. And it's <laughs> a regular Texas town, and I have nine, I have nine or ten citizens that I discuss there, at least I do their parts on the stage in this one-man theater I did. And Ben Rutledge, I drive in, he's one of the first citizens I met there. I drove into to, uh, uh, Pear Orchard to, and uh, as the edge of town, I came to this little filling station grocery store and pulled up to get directions down to the courthouse, and uh, it was uh, an unremarkable filling station, grocery store, uh, there was a man leaning, sitting in a straight back chair, pushed back against the wall, dozing with his hat about half over his face, and uh, 
in the gravel walkway, there was a little boy playing stick horse on a double barrel shotgun, <laughs> riding it as a stick horse, galloping up there. And that was very impressive as far <laughs> as I was concerned. And so as I stopped at the gas pump, I wasn't, didn't want gas, just was going to ask direction. This man came down in his chair. And I said, wait, don't, don't get up, mister. I just want to get directions. I don't want gas. And well, I can give you directions a heap cheaper than I can give you gasoline in this <laughs> day and time. <laughs> and I said, well, can you tell me how to get down to the courthouse? Yes, sir, I sure can tell you how to go down there. You go down that there third red light, and uh, Marvin, honey, Papa's asked you not to ride that shotgun around like that. It ain't no stick horse. He ain't supposed to ride it like that. It ain't nice for little boys to play with no loaded shotgun that way. <laughs> uh, court, you can't miss the courthouse there. You swing right there. Papa, that courthouse been sitting there now since 1910. Papa helped build that. Papa was one of the carpenters on it. I say 1910. Now, it could have been 1912. I ain't Sure. Marvin, honey, quit a staring down the barrel of that shotgun. You go blow your head off and your mama wear you out, young man. And uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, old Judge Hawkins will tell you just exactly when that courthouse was built. I, of course, I don't know what you're going there for. You might be going there to get you divorced or get married. You can't never tell. Marvin, honey. Don't be pointing a shotgun at Papa. It ain't nice for little boys point load shotguns at their daddies. Now you take that in the house and get put it up, honey. I've told you, <laughs> Marvin, baby. Don't be pointing it at the man in the car. It makes people nervous to point loaded shotguns at him. Yes, it does. What do you think he's laying down in that car like that for, <laughs> Mister? Mister, don't try to drive off like that laying down that away, Mister. Mister. <laughs> And he couldn't hit you if he was to shoot at you, mister. He ain't no shot at all. Mister, I wouldn't drive like that. And when you get to that third red light, it might be green. <laughs> <laughs> that actually happened in kind of a modified form. But I, I love them. I love, well, I love the people of Texas, actually. They're, they're a pretty good bunch of people. John, I suspect that a lot of your egalitarian nature comes from your upbringing. Oh, you, yes. You buddied around a lot with, uh, with uh, colored people as well as white. Yes. You had some experiences with Snooky Bates, is that the name? Yes, that was... Daddy, Daddy and Mama were pretty remarkable people, I realize. Uh, Mama was a school teacher, and interestingly enough, she was born right down here at Weberville, Texas, just 12 miles from city limits, you know, and uh, lived there and in Austin all her life, which was well over half a century. And uh, so my roots ran pretty deep into this culture. But they were both enlightened people. My father, as I said, had been a sharecropper, but he had learned after he'd grown almost to read and write and then go to school, went to the University of Texas and got his law degree just before the turn of the century and became a very successful lawyer here in town, but became a socialist in about 1904, 1906. Ran for governor on the socialist ticket here in Texas. They had a big, so you see, mm. this is what isn't known about Texas, and this is what aggravates me. It's not known that Texas had a rich, progressive background, you know, the Knights of Labor were formed here, right, and the Populist Party uh, was a very prominent part of Texas politics, and it was, uh, this is why Dobie and Betacek and Webb excited me so, because they were out of that tradition. They were all three born and raised in Texas, yet there weren't three more progressive minds ever created in the United, existed in the United States of America than those three. Because when I told you a minute ago that Dobie was a racist, something of a racist, when I first met him in the 30s, he also loathed and despised Roosevelt. He thought the New Deal was going to wreck America, going to give jobs to a bunch of trifling people that didn't deserve them. People ought to get out and make their own. Sound very much like old Ronnie Reagan does now, <laughs> and like Herbert Hoover did back there. He doesn't sound like a populist, does he? But old Dobie, 
Dolby had that great gift that I like to associate with America, the United States of America, the great gift of an unfettered mind, a liberated mind, and he learned, and his horizons broadened and broadened by the by the month after we got to be friends. And Betacek, who was Roy Betacek, was really he's so little known here in the state, and yet he should be the most prominent citizen should rank up there ahead of Jim Hogg and Jimmy Allred. He was just a great, great mind. My God, that man was a classicist, a great socialist, and a great social thinker, and a gentleman, and a poet, and a, and a naturalist. He'd leaned his ear over close to the earth, and he'd caught the rhythms and the sounds of the Texas earth. And there wasn't a wild flower that blossomed in all the state of Texas that he couldn't identify instantly by its perfume or by its sight. And there wasn't a wild bird that nested anywhere in Texas he couldn't identify in a twinkling. This was Roy Betacek, and he had a great influence on me and on Doby. See, he was Doby's closest friend. And he and I would despair over Doby, some of Doby's reactionary and rather backward observations about race and that sort of thing, and, and particularly about Roosevelt, because Mr. Betacek and I both were very fond of what the New Deal was trying to do. It was, from my point of view and from Betacek's point of view and from Daddy's point of view, this is what the American government was all about, what these men had founded. After all, a part, of a, part of our preamble says to to not only to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare. This is the people's servant doing its best to promote, uh, promote uh, taking the responsibility for those that are not fortunate. This is what American government should be about. And Roosevelt was bringing that into being. Well, within four or five years, old Doby had come around to our point of view. And within 10 years, we were trying to catch up. <laughs> he, he, you know, he was attacked during the McCarthy period. He, was, he had his, uh, uh, his uh, passport denied him in 1952. He had a teaching appointment in, over in Ankara, the American University in Ankara. And to the everlasting disgrace of the State Department and that terrible, terrible era called the McCarthy period, named for Senator McCarthy, Doby wasn't allowed... Uh, he was considered a danger to the United States. What a shocking thing. What I wanted to say in this book, one of the things I wanted to say is that we're a pretty splendid people if we recognize what makes us splendid. It's not the narrow bigoted and the, and the, and the reactionary. That's not ever a period that we, uh, periods that we brag about. Do you all realize that in 1950, for the first time in the history of the United States, the word treason was used in political dialogue in our society to attack a political opponent. Most Americans don't realize that, and very few, very few even political commentators realize that this was the first time it was ever used to describe a political opponent. By McCarthy, he said we'd lived under 20 years of treason. And old Dick Nixon echoed that, you know. Yeah. They found that paid off in political pay dirt. And if you, if you can understand the poison of it and how, how a great cost it has been to us in the American, in our, in American society, in our, in our society. After all, it cost us the Vietnam War, the uh, Watergate, it institutionalized secrecy in government. It had a terrible punitive effect on our society. John Henry, in your book also, <clears throat> you not only have things that are, you know, funny and a lot of political humor and satire, but you have some serious stories in there too that really grip you because you catch the color of them, like the mm. poor boy who was given a orange for Christmas. And yes. was so delighted because that's the first orange you Well, had. you know, that's another aspect of my life that I try to get into the book, is that the, uh, in, uh, I was raised out in South Austin, and people from up in, along Barton Creek and up in the 
hills west of Austin. It's now become a very fashionable residential area, but at that time, nobody lived up there but uh, people who chopped wood for a living. The very poorest of our, of our society lived up there, and they'd come down in the winter and camp along a creek below our house down there, about a half a mile from our home, in the shabbiest and most desolating kind of habitations, or lived in lean-tos with all their children. And this had a great impression on me. I played with them. My father was very tolerant and very, very sympathetic with them, because he'd been raised pretty much that way himself. And so I was naturally moved into a role of, of uh, tolerance with them. They went to Fullmore School out in South Austin and always had a faint scent of urine, you know, because they slept in the same clothes that they came to school in, and it was a heartbreaking, but I was very early on established a relationship with them. And in the instance you were telling about, I remember I was about 10 years old, this little boy, cold, cold Christmas morning. A lot of times it's not cold at Christmas time in Texas, but it was a cold, frosty morning, and he came running up to the house barefooted in a pair of overalls from down on the creek where he lived with an orange. It just I went to the door, and he was standing there. I said, look what old Sandy Claus brung me. His father had gotten it the day before at a shrine Christmas tree for the poor and the needy. And he said, God, God, did you ever see that? I said, that ain't no real Christmas gift. Uh, so that's, that's just an orange shoot. That ain't nothing special. And his little face fell, you know. And he said, that's the only Christmas present I ever got, Johnny. And it, then he stuck there like a knife. I realized I'd said a terrible thing to that child. Uh, well, these experiences like that had a, also a very educational effect on me. Also, uh, <clears throat> for the first time in your book, I noticed that you use the medium of a blue jay uh, as as part of a little dialogue jay, between yeah. you and yourself. Lester and blue jay. Lester blue jay. LBJ. That's right. <laughs> That's kind of tacky out there. <laughs> How did you happen to pick that with, with the well, LBJ? Well, I, 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 I'd wanted to, I'd wanted to say something about the. You see, we what we have never done, and what I realized, and this was written during the Vietnam War, America wasn't looking at what they were doing we, in Vietnam, the cost to the Vietnamese people, the napalming, the ga using using poisons to. Uh, behaving in a way that Hitler would have behaved. And this appalled me, because I'm very proud of our society and its heritage. And I felt this was a denigration and a negation of everything that was decent about America, to go over there to a fourth-rate, primitive country, agricultural country, and carry the latest in death and desolation. And we still haven't looked at that, by the way. And so in order to make a point, I used this Blue Jay, Lester Blue Jay, that would come around taunting me about the in imbecility and the inhumanity that was being visited. Uh, we, uh, uh, the Vietnam War had a very profound effect on me. I thought it was uh, one of the most disastrous things that had ever happened to us. Brutal, the brutalization of the Americans, because we had to watch it on television, see, and to see our troops marching over, you know, burning down the homes of these people, desolating their fields, uh, primitive people, uh, people that were struggling, and I most uh, just to stay alive. And we've never really stopped and examined what we did, what a desolating, terrible thing we did over there to those people. We still have it today. You know, the boys that got the Agent Orange, Agent Orange, uh, award from these these chemical companies that manufactured it to go over there and spread it over that land. They've won a degree of sympathy and they've also won a lawsuit. <laughs> they're, they're being awarded something, some compensation for the suffering of themselves and their families for this Agent Orange that our own government visited on. 
But what about the millions of Vietnamese people who had this poured on them in their homes? What about the disfigured children over there today? We don't even pay any mind to them. It's so that we never were there. We still have a self-righteous, pompous uh, behavior. And to think that the President of the United States would say, this is our, it was a noble war. Nonsense. This 10th anniversary we've just been celebrating, shame on us. We've got better than that in us. None of us have talked about what we did to them. We're talking mostly about, and just, I have a great sympathy for Vietnam veterans. They did get a shabby deal. They were sent off to a, to a desolating experience that shattered many of their lives, and they've not, you know, recovered from it yet. And we did precious little for them, and have done precious little for them. But that's, that's not to say that we didn't also visit death and desolation on those people over there. And they're doing the same thing in Nicaragua and Grenada. And what, and yes, where it, it's say it almost, almost, it's as almost it was. Pr they'd written a scenario, taken a scenario from Vietnam, and are running it off in Nicaragua and El Salvador now, all based on this, this. Uh, the commies going to get you. Do you know? I've heard very distinguished and intelligent Americans saying, you know, at El Salvador. If we don't stop that, what is it, the Sandinistas there? In Nicaragua, the Sandinistas. Well, they'll, they'll be at our borders. Do you realize, honey, <laughs> yeah. there are more people in Harris County, Texas today than there are in El Salvador, and these jack and apes are saying they're about to come over our border? This is, a, you know, Cousin Ed Snodgrass. Now, he supports the president in El Salvador, 100 percent, I mean, in in Central America, and particularly in Nicaragua, cutting it's not very said, I'll tell you this, Ronnie's smart. Ronnie understands that Sandinista crowd down there. And that everything going on in Nicaragua, and I back him a hundred percent. Do you realize them are Sandinistas you read so much about? Ronnie has read a book, or read, he didn't read a whole book, but he read the uh, <laughs> Reader's Digest, where that crowd of heathens is Nicaraguans too. Sandinistas ain't nothing in the world but Nicaraguans too. Now what does that tell us about the Sandinistas? That they've had the audacity to infiltrate their own country. <laughs> now, that's as low down the infiltration as is, where you infiltrate yourself. They're doing it. Well, he also believes that Grenada, you know, he said, oh, did you hear President Reagan say we got to Grenada just in time. You know what he meant by that? I'll tell you what he meant by that. They got secret plans of them Grenadians, had all the plans drawn up where they were going to sweep up the Atlantic and Pacific coast and lock us in between, and every man, woman, child in America would have to sign their name if they'd be a Marxist-Leninist puppet, <laughs> or it'd be Katie put the cat out. Oh, that's what that was. I thank goodness for Ronnie Reagan. He does all his thinking first. <laughs> well, that that unfortunately is far more accurate than I'd like to think, my dear, as far as what they what was really said to justify the biggest, most powerful, overwhelmingly armed affluent society on the face of the earth to going to the smallest, poorest island in the entire western hemisphere, an island of less than 100,000 people, and bogging in with, what, 6,000, 8,000 troops? <laughs> and they managed, what they didn't, they, I don't think they had over 1,000 armed resistors down there, did they? Just a few hundred. And 650 or 700 uh, Cuban Cuban workers on their thing then. This is obscene, you see. This is this is a blot. This isn't a matter of pride. This should be a matter of deep, deep embarrassment and shame to the American people. There's a book out, you have to read that. It's not just my book, but there's another <laughs> one out called uh, Oh, it's an English journalist that was there that tells exactly in what Grenada? happened. In Grenada. Have you seen it? No. Yes, in Grenada. Uh -huh. And it really is a revelation because it ain't what. Well, of course, the American people have no idea what happened in Grenada because the administration, to its everlasting disgrace, shut the 
stress out for three days. And so that the American public knows, very much as the public in any totalitarian society knows, only what the government tells them they can know. Only what is printed in the, the official word uh, that, that uh, Washington gave you on things. So we never really knew what happened. And any American tells mm -hmm. you he knew exactly what happened down in Grenada is talked to his hat. Mm -hmm. John Henry, I'm in a terrible dilemma here. I'd like to continue talking, but I made you a promise that we'd well, let you go right at the uh, You all time. have both been awful nice. So, Craig, listen, where are you from, son? Well, I hate to admit it, but I'm from New York. Well, it's good to have you down here. I wish more New Yorkers like you'd come down here. <laughs> That's right. Help us out. Well, John Henry, thank you so much. Am I holding this? <laughs> yeah, hold it up again. We're going to sell maybe two or three. <laughs> well, and, uh, we'd like to uh, come back again. And maybe you all have been real sweet about it. I'd really appreciate it very, very much. Well, the people are going to be anyway. most appreciative of the people who've been watching. I always enjoy being on this program. <laughs> But at any rate, Cousin Ed was telling me about what a wonderful thing it was to have Alexander Haig, that profound thinker on nuclear war. He said, John, you know the most misunderstood thing in America today? Nuclear war. It's dangerous. <laughs> and the average American don't know just how dangerous it is. The only person I really know that understand nuclear war is Alexander Haig. You old liberals and you old weak-minded, pussyfooting Democrats and all such as that lay back and say, well, we can kill everybody in Russia 25 times. That's plenty. Got enough nuclear bombs to blow them all off the face of the earth 25 times. And we're going to rest on that. They can't kill us but 12 times. <laughs> Johnny, that's where Alexander Haig's great mind comes in. He knows that you have a first-class, all-out nuclear war and find out them Russians have secretly slipped around and can kill us 30 times and we still stuck back there at 25. <laughs> That's what the next war is going to be about. And it'll be too late to go around and apologize to <laughs> Alexander Haig then. He won't even speak to you then. And... I jumped him the other day on it. He, 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 or he jumped me. He said, Johnny, I know you hear what this old student's out at the university doing. They're protesting that there grenade war down there that Ronnie's trying to run. It's just disgusting. They uh, get out there and they start that protesting business and protesting business. I think they just ought to do something to them. I said, now, wait a minute, Cousin Ed. Don't you believe in the right to dissent? Of course I believe in the right to dissent. I'd knock a man's teeth down his throat that didn't interfere with my right to dissent. Ronnie believes in the right to dissent. What him and me is trying to put a stop to is this criticism. <laughs> criticize, criticize, criticize. Why can't they leave Ronald Reagan alone and let him fight his wars in peace? They want to criticize somebody, let them go down there and criticize old Castro and that crowd of heathens. Johnny, we got there to Grenada just in time. Oh, my God, you don't understand what was going on. Ronnie does, though. Do you know that bunch of rascals down there was planning to attack us any morning? They've got us pinned in here between the Gulf of Mexico and the Arctic Circle and gonna come a-sweeping in here like a dose of salts through a widow woman throwing guns down on us, all of us, and making us sign our names to test papers and, and such as that, that we come, that we'll be Marxist-Leninists or they won't let us up again. I'll tell you, Ronnie has just saved America. That's what he's done from an invasion of them rascals. I asked a friend of mine that's a great champion of the Reagan administration to explain Ronald Reagan's foreign policy to me. And he says, oh, I'm glad you asked me that. Let me tell you something, honey. It's just as clear and simple as you please. It's easy to understand. John Tower, Senator Tower, explained it to me the other day. Johnny, it's this way. I can tell it to you because I can discuss it honestly. You know, Ronald Reagan loves the truth. 
and I love the truth, and I love to tell it in a plain English, the language the Holy Bible was wrote in, the language that old mother of mine spoke. I sometimes think that the Almighty, in his divine wisdom, when he saw fit to create his most perfect work here on earth, selected the lone star state of Texas as paradise on earth. And he came to this Garden of Eden on earth, Travis County, Texas. And he caught the gold from the Texas sunrise, and he caught the sweetest notes from the throat of the Texas mockingbird, our state bird. And he caught the perfume of the Texas blue bonnet, our state flower. And he compounded and molded it all together into that quintessence of sweetness and that epitome of all virtue and goodness. My mother. Well, now, son, that's what Ronald Reagan's foreign program is all about. And if you don't understand it fully, I'll explain it further. Our old man Tom Taylor said, Johnny, the trouble with the world today are that we have gone and invented a way of wiping ourselves off the globe, and we done it before we invented a way to stop ourselves from doing it. Well, this is right where we are today. There is no alternative to peace. Remember this. When Phil Graham stands up and says, I represent the best interest of the people of the 6th Congressional District, it's about like a big old possum laying up in a hen house <laughs> claiming, I represent the Poultryman's Association in this section. And what is happening in Austin, Texas, is these brutal, manipulating, money corporations. They're not people, you understand. A corporation isn't a person. As Peabody and Jeffrey said, it has no, it has no uh, heart to fill nor no behind to kick. <laughs> well, a corporation is a faceless thing that lives entirely for profit. And it can't consider the human factor involved as it greedily devours the earth, as it destroys the society. Well, John Henry, I thank the people in Austin run him out, you know, and we let him come to Madisonville. That is our second mistake, but somebody had to take him in. And uh, J.R. Pardon told him he had a good lake over there, and he'd, he'd make him manager of this lake. And he said, well, he'd never seen the lake, and need somebody that fishes over there pretty regular to show me around. And so I was the one that was elected to go with him to the lake. I carried him over there fishing one day. It's in the spring of the year, and these water moccasins had just come out, you know, and laying these little bud and willow trees grow out over the lake, and those big old moccasins laying up in under there. And John Henry was sitting on the middle, and I was running the boat, and I run it up in under some of them bushes, and this old water moccasin fell out in the boat, and when it did, John Henry come on wow then. And I just stepped out of the boat and headed for the land. He hollered, wait, P. Ryan. I said, don't leave me here with this snake. I said, well, John Henry, this is that time you heard about when three is a crowd. Uh, John, Henry, John Henry was always involved in something. When he seen somebody being mistreated or seen some big corporation trying to force some little man into something that he didn't think was right, well, John Henry was up taking his side in it. He, He's always been for the working man. John Henry is a real friend of ours in Leon County. We were in trouble here about two and a half years ago with this nuclear waste uh, storage here in Leon County. And John Henry came, came up and stood up with us, fought against this nuclear waste here in Leon County. And also he went to Austin with us to fight with us. And fortunately, we've, we were able to have a bill passed in Austin, made some strong restrictions on the nuclear waste. At this time, we don't, we, don't, we don't have the nuclear waste here. But we feel like the fight is still on, and, and I feel like that John Henry will continue to fight with us uh, when we call him. You bet. I think John Henry would make a good congressman. I sure do, because he, he's always 
taken up in fighting somebody's battle for him, helping him. He'll, uh, I have on several occasions seen John Henry help people, and when he didn't have the time, I've heard him say he didn't have the time being in his home when he had got phone call, people wanting him to help them do something, and he would talk to them and tell them he'd help them, and after they'd hang up, he said, boy, I just sure don't have the time to do that. I said, I'm, I said I've just got to help the, that old boy. Or, I said, I, so that, I feel like that kind of man that, uh, that will take his time and not do what he really should be doing to benefit himself, but he'll go and help He'll help another man rather than Race. doing for herself. I don't know what will be the results, but I'll always feel good about what I did. I've done, I've said to the people what I wanted to say to them on every issue that I felt was important. And uh, I'm very saddened by the prospect of the 6th Congressional District being bought and paid for by a man with millions of dollars behind him. I think this is a sad commentary, a very sad commentary on our society. You understand that there was a, around 100,000 people over 65 in the 6th Congressional District, and at least half of them, and this is the heartbreaking thing, depended on Social Security for their sole income. This was their survival, and they're literally terrified.